Alright, so in the last tutorial we tracked some 2D points and in this one we're going to solve a camera. I've changed the shot just to spoost things up a little bit. Also just want to mention that we're not diving into sensor sizes or focal lengths with this. We're just going to keep it straightforward how to solve a camera and yeah, easy. Uh, okay, so we're going to be spending our time within the solver tab and you can see our layout changed and we have some new buttons. If you don't want the layout to change, you can go ahead and just click through the icons instead. Also, you'll have F2 for your camera view, F3 for your 3D view, F4 for your quad view, and F, uh, sorry, just regular 4 for your quad view with the 3D view. So I'm going to be using those buttons later uh, because we're going to be swapping through them in this tutorial. I'm not going to go through every single button here. A lot of these honestly deserve a video of their own because a lot of these things do a lot of other things. So we're just going to go through some of the simpler stuff and I'll talk about as I, uh, I almost did it perfectly. <laughs> and we're going to top, uh, oh my god, we're going to talk about it as we go. You know what, I've recorded this so many times, I'm leaving that in. Alright, so with that, let's get started on calculating this camera. So let's go ahead and immediately hit the big green go button. Alright, so now we have this window, which I'm just going to hit OK for. This is some handy information to look at if you uh, know how to. I honestly don't look too much into this, but this is very helpful for troubleshooting. So OK. And what Synthize did immediately is it went and picked two starting frames, a beginning and an end frame. So from those two frames, it calculated uh, a solve with those points on those two frames. And then it went and solved every other frame using... Uh, that initial solve. So that is what automatic does. And from here on, I'm going to jump into refine because refine will take what you have and work off of it. So whenever you do a solve, generally it's a good idea just to jump into refine. Unless your solve is crap to begin with, then keep working in automatic until you get something kind of decent that you're comfortable working with. So I'm going to jump into refine because it looks like things are generally looking pretty good. So now that I've covered that, uh, I also want to mention that there are some stuff going on with points on the edge of the uh, on the edge of the screen. If I look over here, we could see that these points are kind of sliding around. These points, uh, these yellow points, are the actual 3D solved points. They are representative of what your CG is going to be doing once it's applied anywhere. So if your points on the wall here are sticking accurately, then you know, your CG is going to stick. But let's say we put some graffiti on this pillar right here. If I lock on to this point and watch as this 3D point slides, that slide that is happening, that is what your CG is going to do on the wall if you happen to put graffiti here. Got a quick insert here. Something I realized I forgot to explain is the solve error. So the solve error is this number you get up here under your big green go button. That is an average error of all the trackers in your scene. If you hover over your trackers, you can get this little error here like 0.28 or 0.23, 1.06. All your trackers will tell you what their average slide is and that slide is basically how much slide there is between the solve point and the tracker itself. And you could see that this is about a full pixel. So if I hover over this, yeah, we've got about a pixel error right here. It says 1. So the error for every tracker gets rounded up and is put up top here for this overall average error. My overall average is 0.4. So all of my trackers on average are sliding by half a pixel. That's pretty damn good. Although for this shot, I do have rolling shutter and weirdness on my lens, so my solve isn't the most perfect. That's just what Synthize came up with. Solve errors in most software aren't always the most cut and dry kind of a deal. But yeah, hopefully I explained that well. And let's jump back to the actual... Uh. So we need to correct that. Why is it even there? Uh, it is there because of lens distortion. So if we look at this pillar, you can see there's actually a bit of a bend to it. So we want to clean up that bend. We want to calculate for the, for the lens distortion. All lenses have distortion. Lenses, some lenses used to advertise themselves with 0D, like zero distortion. They don't anymore because it was a lie. All lenses have distortion. 
Uh, there are rectilinear lenses, which kind of reduce distortion, but rectilinear lens apparently is not this universally agreed on term. <laughs> so, you know, to varying degrees, they've reduced their distortion. Uh, yes, so now uh, we want to remove the distortion because all other software, like if I look in a 3D view, look at this. These are straight lines. This is how Maya, Nuke, Houdini, Blender, like all want to work with. They want to work with straight lines. So we have to de-warp this plate. To do that, we're just going to go over to the left and check off calculate distortion. Before I hit go, I just want to mention real quick, if I drag the spinner, look at how the points grow and expand. That is what our distortion is doing. I undid that, just so you know. If I go to the lens tab, uh, actually no, let's go to the F3, like the perspective view, and then L, lock to camera. In this view, if I right click, we are now in pan 2D mode. So I can scroll around and see what Synthize has done. But what's nice about this view is that the plate is on a mesh that we can actually warp and see what the distortion does. So that is what we are going to be calculating. You can see that I am kind of straightening, straightening out the pillars here by hand, but we don't want to do that by hand. So while I'm here and with Calculate Distortion checked on, I can hit Shift G, which is a hotkey for solving, and watch the plate as it uh, gets a pretty nice distortion quite accurately by Synthize. So now when I play, things are looking pretty cool. If I go back to F2 and look at that same point, there's still some distortion. So if I undo and redo though, you can see that the point has improved. And this additional bit of distortion could be because we need to add some extra distortion parameters to help synthesize out. So this could be a case of some mustache distortion where there is one level of distortion, but then there is another kind of a pin cushion effect on the corner where the corners need to warp out more than the rest of it. Synthize has a uh, some pretty common parameters here, but it doesn't have as much as software like 3D Equalizer. So let's just see what it does here. My lens might be a little bit crazy for Synthize to handle. Let's find out. So I'm going to turn on Cordic, and Cordic, if I drag that around, you could see when I warp it here, we got this curve here from Quadratic, which is the default, and then it curves upwards at the corners. So when I hit Solve, let me just right click. I don't have to undo that, but let's just C for our reference. So let's see if these points get any better. Shift G. So it improved a little bit. Uh, we're just going to leave it there because I have not looked into my lens enough to know what I'm dealing with for this tutorial, but you know, that's all you needed to know about distortion at this point. So we have, I'm going to go back to the solver tab and I'm going to hit F2 just to get my larger view back. So now that we've done this, we're going to jump into refining our camera. Um, or sorry, we're going to move into orienting our camera. If I hit F3 and look at it here, this is just kind of a default angle that Synthize came up with. Often it doesn't, it never comes out looking this good. This looks like, it looks like Synthize kind of came up with something nice, but you could see the, the axis lines don't match up with the brick here. It's pretty crooked. The horizon line is not level. So we need to straighten the scene out and put a couple pieces of geometry to reference for our building to make sure things are correct. And we will also likely project some of these points onto our geo just to make them perfectly flat to better represent these walls and then solve with constraints. So to get started, we are going to be jumping over to uh, the 3D tab. I just wanna quickly talk about this tab because we're going to spend some time in here moving our camera scene around. So I'm just going to run through some of these buttons now. So right here, we can see all the geometry we have access to. So I can make an earthling, click and drag. We can make this guy around 170 centimeters over here. That's about the scale that's mostly industry standard. Uh, we can take a box, click and drag. Oops, I, okay, click, hold, and let go, and then you're doing the height. Uh, we got some spheres. And to move the stuff around, you can come down to Translate, Rotate, and Scale. And if you want hotkeys for that, W, E, and R, just like most other software. So I can move this, rotate it, scale it. 
I'm going to delete it now with backspace. And let's take a look at our points. So I do want, I am going to start coloring up these points here soon so we can make out what they are because I'm going to be moving this whole scene. And to move this whole scene, uh, whole scene around, uh, you don't just want to take your translate and grab your camera or if you can, like point stuff, uh, because you're going to introduce a big kink into the animation. What you want to do is click on whole so that you can move your whole scene. And sometimes if you have geometry in here, let's say you made a ground plane, by the way, pipe key or the forward slash underneath the backspace key, that's your wireframe. It's right there. That's the button. Uh, so yeah, if I went whole move, you could see that it moves the geo too. Sometimes you may not want that. You might want to right click 3D whole effects meshes off. So now you can position your scene and try to flatten out and have some geometry there to look at. Uh, so with that being said, with the geometry made and me showing you how to move the scene around, let's jump into a manual way to color code these points and then orient this scene. And then after that, I'm gonna show my favorite way using the lens tab. So let's go and look at the camera view with F2 I'm going to select some points that I want to remember. These look like some nice y-axis points. Um, let's give this a color like yellow, maybe. Uh, let's find some points all over this wall. I don't know if these are on the same planar surface as these because this wall might extrude out a little bit. So I'm not going to grab that. Let's color this something like magenta. Is there any more here? No, there isn't. Again, I don't know if these walls extrude out, so I'm kind of scared to color these and these as the same thing. And because I'm going to be able to tell which wall is which, I'm pretty comfortable in taking this wall and making these the same color. Let's try yellow. Sometimes I also like to take my points that are on the symmetry line of a set, if you have a symmetrical set, and give them a color that's recognizable. Let's go blue. And also ground points. Ground points are very handy to keep track of. And we'll color those white. All right, so we've colored a lot of points. So we should see the floor, which could be our, you know, our X, Z plane. We've got our walls, which will show us what's, you know, kind of straight and vertical. Yeah, so let's take a look over in the 3D tab and look over here. So as we're orienting this, as we're rotating our scene around, we want to actually be able to see some kind of some kind of lines over in this view. So I'm going to hit regular four on my keyboard, which will give us the same quad view, but with the 3D perspective window. So now, whoops, didn't want to rotate from there, just wanted to drag this down. So now what we can do is use the grid here to kind of help you straighten things out. So I'm going to try put the center of the scene, so that symmetrical line I colored, at the center. All right, okay for now. And now from there, I'm going to switch to rotate. Again, W, w E, R lets you swap between these options. So now I'm going to look from this angle and I could see my two walls here. These should be flat. So if I rotate here, you could see those walls are flattening out over here. So I could, I could watch that. I could also see if they should be matching the grid here. Like it looks like those points should be even spaced to the grid lines like this. 
This tells us that this building might be crooked or just, you know, not as straight as I thought. It's an older building. It could have warped. Ground could have shifted. I don't know. Ground could have shifted. Some, that happens to some buildings. Don't act like I'm crazy. You're crazy. Um, so I don't really like that, uh, that early sign of tragedy now. So we're going to see what we end up with here. So now let's take a look over at this. Hopefully this is a straight line and I can drag from the top view these blue points and I can drag this and see that we're straightening, uh, straightening out that line there. Okay, so hopefully things are kind of straight on uh, the X, no, hopefully things are straight on the Z axis. Now let's try tilt it this way, because look at our horizon line, it's too high. You can take these lines on the wall and kind of do your vanishing point thing, and the horizon line should be much lower. So I could rotate on the side and drop this down. It doesn't look too bad actually. So I'm going to go to the front view and I want to try and level out the horizon line to the lines here and the lines over here. Actually you get a pretty nice view over here. You can see this, right? So let's rotate from the floor or from the blue dots, whatever you want, honestly. All right. So that looks pretty level right there, but if you look out, Oh, actually, that looks pretty good. I was going to uh, give a disclaimer that I thought this building was going to be crooked enough that these weren't going to fit. Oh, look at me. Look at me tricking myself. So now, looking over here, let's see what our building is doing. So it looks like our wall points aren't super flat, which is honestly fine. Uh, either the building's crooked or they don't have enough parallax from the camera move to actually calculate super accurate positions, which is likely the case. Cameras that push in like this, uh, like these points are close. All these close up points have loads of data and parallax to calculate, but these ones up here kind of turn on at the end of the end half of the shot and don't have as many frames to work with. So these points are likely going to be forced with uh, some geometry that we're about to build. All right, so let's start to, actually, I'm not gonna build geometry yet for this because I want to show the nifty automated way to do this. So that was just the manual way and I just did that to show you whole and that you can move things around and correct things and just how to navigate this stuff. Like right now, I can also make a box, scale it, out to try and fit these walls as best as we can scale it up in height and now we'll invert normal so we see the inside of it and if you come over here you'll see there's a little pound sign and you can increase the divisions and now if I hit F2 look at that we can use geometry to check our scenes you can see the floor is not on the floor so if I hit F4 look at the white dots come to whole move and these white dots are kind of all over the place, as you can tell. That's fine. The ground is not even. That's expected. So F2. So yeah, you can bring in your geo, start doing some tests, and look at how crooked this is up here. So all these little mistakes that I made trying to line this up could be corrected using the automated process, or it's going to tell us that this building is as crooked as this and there's no hope for us to get a perfect, perfect perspective. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna delete this box for now, I don't need it. F4, uh, turn whole off so I can select this and delete with backspace. Okay, so just to make it look more extreme, I'm gonna mess this up a little bit. There we go. I just wanted to make it really crooked so we can really see the difference with these lines. So I'm gonna jump over to the lens tab You'll notice that what we're about to use, these add line buttons, are also in the solver room, but you can't use them here. You have to be in the lens tab. I don't even know why they're included. Maybe that's fixed in newer versions of Synthize. I don't know. So now that we're here, 
Uh, let, we gotta pick a frame that has the most perspective data for us to work with. So that could be here. We have some very clean Y lines. We got some Z lines. We got some X lines cutting across these windows and all this stuff. We could go over here too. We have a pretty extreme angle of everything. We got these extreme Z lines all over. Y lines going up these windows and up the center of the building. And we got a lot more X lines going up and down. Uh, so honestly, this will probably work the same in most of these frames, but generally I like to start on a frame that includes a bit of ground. So I'm just going to come right here, get a little bit of that pillar. We have some ground that if we had to model some geometry, we can connect the geometry right here and figure out where the ground is. If you needed to project some ground points. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So we're in the lens. We're in the lens room. I want to get rid of this lens grid. It's kind of useless right now and it's just in my way. So I'm going to right click view show lens grid off and let's start laying down some lines. So these lines might be a little bit tricky to understand at first, but I'm just going to run through it real quick and then I'll delete the lines and actually, no, I'm just going to put down the lines and I'll try to explain it as best as I can. So I'm going to click add line. And we just got to pick two axes, two axes that are, that is our favorites. So I kind of like my Z and I like my Y. So let's start with Z. I'm going to click and drag out and hit on Z. The on axis lines are our main lines. Make sure that your lines are nice and snug in the detail. And let's go with a Y line. I kind of like this. On Y. I could actually use these windows because whoop, the windows are longer up here. So those are our two main axis lines. We don't want a third. Synthize will tell you it does not want a third. It only wants two, so pick your favorite two. It doesn't matter which. But I'm just going to delete this X. I could have used X. You could use whatever you want if you, have, if you have the lines to go along with it. So we have Z and Y. Let's put down our parallel lines. So I like this over here. The more lines that you put, the more that they're going to average out if there's any error. Oh, I don't like that. Undo. Also notice that the lines are also bent. They're meant to match up with our distortion so that you can see the actual curvature with the undistorted shot. Okay, let's get some Z lines. Probably good enough. And now, I said that Synthize does not want a third main axis line, but you can make the third axis, whatever your axis is, just parallel. No need to have a main line. All right, so now that we have all three axes covered, uh, we can go ahead and hit a line. So if you didn't have a solve to start with, this will actually calculate you a focal length. Uh, and it'll do a pretty good job at it too. 
But if you didn't have a solve and you didn't have a distortion, make sure you put down some lines and if you see some curvature, make sure that you manually try to match the curvature in your shot because you need distortion. Uh, you you need to undistort your shot if you're plan if you plan on modeling it and building it out and projecting points. Okay, so now that we have that, let's hit F3 and again, if you're not locked to camera, come up to hit lock or hit L on your keyboard. So let's hit a line. It's not going to calculate us a focal length because we already have a solve. I'm pretty sure it didn't. Yeah, it didn't. So now you can see our grid moved. Our grid moved in a kind of a weird position like this. You could see it's pretty flat. The horizon looks amazing, but it moved up here because the origin places itself wherever your two main axis lines intersect in space. Not a problem. Don't worry about trying to put those axis lines on a ground or anything. Just put them wherever you feel is help uh, like the easiest for you because we're going to move this down manually in a second. So now that we've done this, let's just take a look over here. Our scene is now nice and straight. I'm going to go to 3D move hole already some of these points look really really nice so I'm gonna center that symmetrical line that I colored and let's move this ground upwards so I'm gonna go instead of moving it up like this you could also do it more perfectly and drag the spinners the ground is uneven so I'm just gonna pick I guess this part there we go okay and now that it's symmetrical and the ground is there Let's make a big box. And we'll invert the normals so that we could see it in our camera view. And let's increase some divisions right here. Okay. I don't like what I did here. Let's even that out. Whoops, wasn't even looking at this side. Weird. Oh, okay. My bad. I was I just confused myself. I was trying to make these as uniform quads as I could. I just like quads. So, F2. And let's play this at normal speed. The whole time we've been on frame by frame. So, I'm going to hit normal speed and just give this a watch. Also, you're going to have to excuse the weird buggy line. That's just a thing in 1905, in Synthize 1905. If I wanted that gone, for some reason, if I hit J to hide my solve points, by the way, J to hide solve points, control J to hide trackers. Yeah, for some reason when I hide those solve points, it gets rid of those lines. Okay, so we've now gotten the most average uh, perspective alignment that we could get. So you could see that the brick wall is not perfect on both sides. It's kind of okay here. It's okay there too. Up top it's looking pretty nice, the X lines are looking pretty clean. This is looking pretty nice. Yeah, not perfect on all axes. But we got a pretty damn good base to work with. And this is likely as good as you're going to get. You're, you're probably not going to get anything better if you try to do this by hand. So the, the ground is on an incline going upwards and the buildings are old and crooked. Big surprise. So now that we have this, um, we're going to hit control J, bring back those trackers. Also, just J to bring back the solve points. How would I go and fit some of these points? Like, I can force these points if I want to, or we can just trust that the building is this crooked, and you can model off of this and do your CG to these points, and your CG will stick. But maybe you have a client who's like, ah, I want this stuff perfect. The walls need to be flat and stuff. And for whatever reason, whatever effect on there that they need the wall to be flat. So maybe they're complaining and they want your walls to be perfect. Here's what we can do. 
Um, this box, I'm going to make sure that it's perfectly symmetrical my scene. You can see it's not perfect. I'm going to go to the move thing, which axis is this? Okay, x-axis, if I right click that one, there I've zeroed it out to the center of the world. And I'm going to trust that I am symmetrically centered. And my yellow points, yellow points, okay. So I'm going to project a couple of these points on both walls and force the walls to be flat or flatter. And if I can, I'll also project a couple points in this back wall and see what it does to the solve. Projecting too many walls can be quite risky. I'm actually just going to start with this, this wall here. So let's go... Actually, let's come ahead here. Let's project over here. A little bit more readable of an angle. So I'm going to turn off hole just so I can select a couple points. I like to space these out if I can. If I can. And I don't like to do too many points. Usually like two points on a surface. You do need at least four to have a good constrained solve. Um, but in refined mode, you can have as low as three or whatever. So now that I have these points selected, let's go into F4. And we can watch what happens when I drop these. So if you look at these points that are highlighted red, like right here, here, uh, let's watch this one. This is going to happen to all the points, but let's watch this one here. I can come up to track, drop on the mesh, and now you can see there's a little yellow point on the wall. That is a seed point. If I select this point and come over to trackers, every tracker has a seed and lock window like this. So what we did is we gave it a position, which is this data right here, your X, Y, and Z, and the tracker is now turned on to lock and seed is turned on. Um, so now these points have a lock turned on and a new position that it's going to snap to, which is going to ripple across and make all the other points resolve as well to try and force everything to match these new points. So I'm going to come back to Solver and turn Constrain on. You want to make sure Constrain is on. If it's not on and you have projected points or a seed lock data, Synthize will roughly align as best as it can, but it's not going to force your points unless you have Constrain on. So now when I hit that, if we watch this point and that point over there, these points are also all going to adjust. Let's hit Go. Okay. So now you can see that the points have all moved. Our main points that we wanted are stuck to the wall. And with that, you can see that it also adjusted our solve error, which I completely didn't talk about actually. <laughs> uh, so let's go F2, give our shot a watch. So now we have a slightly new solve. We have our nice alignment that we did with lines. And we constrained to those walls just to make sure that a couple points were actually properly tacked to our CG geometry. This is probably as good as I'm going to get for this. So with that being said, something I want to do real quick is scale the scene, which unfortunately synthize won't let you scale one geometry and not the other. So if I tried to go with a uh, earthling, bring him in, scale him up to 170 centimeters. Now, if I wanted to scale this and go whole scale and scale it up, see the normally you would scale it up until the guy shrinks, but you could see the buildings going along with it. You could go 3D whole effects meshes and then scale it and have the geometry follow, but then that happens. I've tried to find some workarounds. I don't know any. Um, so I'm just going to say screw it and I'm going to hide this geo for now and bring it back later if I want to scale it in. Honestly, I don't really even need it anymore. So I'm going to go whole and scale it up. Whoops. 3D whole effects meshes off and I should also scale it up from the ground. And 
And since I don't have people in the shot to reference for this, what you could do is move your scene until this guy goes and lines up to the to the door against the wall. And you can reference just, you know, human height to a door. Now that I've knocked the symmetry out of my shot, let's just line this up to the center. And then I'm going to move it on Z. Just kind of bring my scene, my, my scene average to the center. There we go. And also, let's move it up. Get the ground up top. Okay. So now that our scene is scaled, our orientation is done. I could bring that box back, but honestly, it's not going to be useful, uh, useful for me anymore at this point. Now that we've oriented our scene, scaled it, uh, we now need to refine the camera. Sometimes you don't have to do this. It depends on what the requirements are for the shot. But for the most part, you generally want to scale the stuff. If I hit F7, F7 will bring our graph editor up. And I'm going to collapse the trackers, open up camera and objects, camera, and turn on solved path. And just look at the translations. Also, I'm going to turn off that color coding. Turn off Z and straighten, us, uh, straighten out these paths. So look at the jitter that's in this path. That's not natural. Most cameras have a weight to it, or they're on a track or a dolly or something, and they don't have these micro jitters. Synthize doesn't filter your camera by default. So if we look at the camera over here, there's a little bit of jitter in there. Now, what's the problem with that? If I go to 3D, come up to the geometry and make a matrix. Matrix lets you create a, a diamond grid that will show you what the space in front of your camera is doing. So this isn't too bad at all, but sometimes the jittering is rather extreme. There is a little bit of jitter here in the path. It's very hard to tell, but again, most shots need some smooth, but not all of them need it. A shot like this, wouldn't really need it unless they wanted you to unless they were extra cautious <laughs> I don't know but if there were spores floating through the air or rain falling down or very slow moving snow they want you want to make sure that the camera is moving as smooth as possible so that when things float past the camera they don't pop around so let's go back to that tri view look at the camera path Let's hide our guy. He's kind of in my way. I'm going to go 3D, hide. Smoothing this path. Let's go over to filtering control. So filtering control lets you smooth the path or the rotations or the, the zoom or the field of view, the zooming lens portion of a camera. For now, we're just going to touch the path and by default, the frequency and strength are kind of strong for a handheld shot. So if I look at the path here, again, F7 brought this window up. If I hit smooth right now, we can watch these mountains just erode away. So we've lost, we've lost some of the path that maybe we wanted to keep. So for a handheld shot, I like to turn the frequency higher to like 15 just to get these higher frequency little pops. So if I hit apply now, we've gotten rid of some of those micro jitters, but we kept the uh, actual movement that my hand was likely making on the shoot. So I'm gonna reset this filter. If you don't reset this, it's gonna apply the smooth to every solve uh, once you hit go. You don't want that to happen. So I'm just gonna close this now and I can hide, I can get rid of this too. Okay, so now that we've smoothed it, depending on the shot, um, you could do a minor smooth like that and call it done. Like the points, they look okay. A little drifty here. That could just be my rolling shutter. But sometimes you might get some drift that looks like this. But that's because we've smoothed the path. The camera has, has subtly moved left and right across the entire frame range because, you know, we've altered the path. So you have to update the rotations in most cases. 
So let's solve just the rotation of this camera now. I'm going to come over to axis locks right here. I'm going to hit more. And just a brief rundown of what this window is. I'm going to actually do the stuff and walk through it as I go. And then I'll explain what everything else is. So I'm going to check off position. Make sure you do this on the first frame because if you do it on another frame, it'll animate on and only lock part of your shot. So first frame, turn on position, uh, and then I'm going to hit get. So what get will do is it's going to get that smooth path that we just made and load it into seed path. When I scrub now, you could see the animation is in these seed path values. So now the lock has something to listen to. So just a quick trying to explain this window one more time. You can lock the camera path or the rotations. Uh, distance is mainly for objects and tough to explain. Or you can lock your, your zoom lens. Uh, when you load in a path, these, this, row, uh, this column of numbers right here is the weighting. Zero is a hard lock, so it's going to just listen to that. But maybe you're like, hey, I just want 50% of that. I want 50% of that jitter to stick around. So you can make this like 60 or something. So you'll have your smooth, but then you'll have a little, little bit of that jitter. So yeah, um, this, is a, this window is just a lot of fancy tools to let you smooth a path and tell it how hard you want it to actually stick to that new smooth path. Right now, we want to use 100%. Zero is basically 100%. I don't know why. So we've gotten our path loaded in. We've turned lock on. Constraint is on because this is some lock constraint stuff. We want constraint on so Synthize listens to it. And yes, I thought I had more to say. So we have the lock. We have the path loaded in. We're in refine. Constraint is on. And go. Man, I wish I explained that part better. It's kind of all over the place. So now that we've done that, if I zoom in on some stuff and just undo redo uh, right here, you could see things have moved subtly, very subtly. And that makes sense. You've, you've done a new solve. The rotations are slightly different. They're slightly corrected. The points are going to move slightly. That's fine. That's normal. But now we have a very smooth foreground. Things are oriented. And we are kind of done with the solve. So let's get ready to export. So to export the shot, we're going to want to export the actual camera itself. Uh, we're going to apply the distortion and write out that sequence so that we can see the undistorted plate in other software. And you're also going to write out an ST map so that compositors can apply it to their CG. First things first. Do not export your camera before you apply the, uh, the distortion. Because when you apply the distortion, it's going to change your focal length and your film back. Yeah, so always make sure you apply your distortion by coming over to Lens Workflow. You can find this Lens Workflow under the Lens tab, Solver tab, and under the Summary tab. Let's just stick with the Solver tab. So Lens Workflow. I'm just going to make sure that Redistorted is checked because that's the common distortion that we use at track VFX. It makes it so we don't have to work with overscan. Now that we've done that, it's going to recache our plate because uh, now we aren't using distortion uh, calculation right here at all. It's actually just applied to the footage. So when you have it applied, never calculate again and never apply distortion on top of this. Never touch that. I wish it was grayed out. I wish it knew. <laughs> um, so now that that's applied, we can export this camera. So we can go to File, Export, and at Track we tend to use either Filmbox FBX or Maya ASCII Scene. I know some other people are using Alembic these days, so up to you. But for this one, I'm just going to keep it easy and use Maya ASCII scene. Just going to navigate to my shot and make, uh, 
At TrafiFX, we will have our own folder structure. I don't know what that looks like at this point in time. But for now, I'm just going to make a folder called Exports. So we're going to export our camera, which has the naming convention of our synthize file. And when I hit OK, we're going to have this pop up, which gives us a couple extra options if we wanted to mess with the stuff. Typically, you can stick with the defaults, except rotation order. Make sure it's ZXY. This is hard to explain. Just trust me. Uh, just, just trust me on that. <laughs> um, hit OK. So our camera is exported. Now, let's write out our plate so we can use it in the other software. Come over to the Summary tab, go to Save Sequence, and we're going to click on the three dots here. You're going to have to navigate again. And I'm going to go to Images, and just a quick cheat. Uh, if you know the format of your shot, select its format. Mine's an EXR, so it shows the sequence. Now I'm going to click on the first frame just to steal its name and the actual, you know, how the frames are going to be numbered. I'm just going to type in underscore UD, so undistorted, and I'm going to change the format to JPEG just to uh, make it easier for the other software to read. Save. And now I can hit start, and if your shot is already cached, it's going to go lightning fast. Um, you know what's funny? Usually that goes even faster. But, eh, whatever. Uh, okay. So now that we've done that, we're going to export our ST maps. And something I want to mention first, I didn't talk about this window yet, but P is for image prep. And image prep, you can do a lot of stuff to the plate. You can grade its, you can give it some light grading, uh, color the uh, bump up the contrast and stuff if you needed to apply some LUTs uh, you can come over to filtering you can blur and clean up some noise uh, yeah but the res tab the res tab you have this down res option which you know it lets you half your resolution if you needed to and this is handy for if your if your computer can't handle the full uh, the full res or if your sequence is like 2,000 frames long and you can't hold it all in the cache. Uh, if you use this, make sure it is set to none again. If you half res your plate and then export your ST maps, you're going to have some very unhappy compositing artists because you're going to degrade the quality of the redistorted CG. If you know that there's a higher res plate that is at the, wor the working project resolution, Make sure you load that into Synthize by coming up to Shot, Change Shot, uh, shot Images, and then loading in the higher res plate. Uh, that's if you brought in somebody else's half res plate. So, let's export these maps. Shot, Right Distortion Maps. Uh, you have sequences here too, if you happen to have an animated zoom lens with distortion. So, Right Distortion Maps, and once again, let's navigate and I'll go to my exports folder. Here I'm going to type in SEUD, so synthize undistortion, underscore version 01, and then dot EXR. Make sure it's an EXR or whatever format you like that can hold this kind of quality. You need, you need some good quality for an ST map. So let's go save, and we're good. So we've exported a camera, We've exported this image sequence so that we can work with it in other software, and we've exported the ST maps. That is all I have for basic solving, and hopefully you enjoyed.